Once in the distant past, there was a kingdom named Avanti, and in that kingdom, a city, Ujjaini. Outside of Ujjaini was a village of Chandala, outcasts. The Bodhisatta was born in that village to a family of acrobats. And on the very same day that he was born, his mother's sister had a son. The one was named Chitta, the other Sambutta. Well, from the time they could walk, the two boys practiced balancing, first on low fences, and on tree branches, and then on rooftops, gaining the skills of their lineage of the acrobats. Of course, sometimes they fell, but you know, falling is an art. And so they suffered bruises, but no broken bones. By the time they grew up, they had mastered all the arts of their lineage. And one day, Chitta said to Sambhuta, My friend, you are a fine acrobat, and so am I. Let us go to the city gates and demonstrate our skill. Well, to show his approval, Sambhuta did a backflip and then walked on his hands and turned three cartwheels in a row. Well, the next morning they set off. Chitta to the northern gate, Sambhuta to the eastern gate. Now, on the very same day, in the city of Ujjaini, there were two young women who were devoted to astrology. They lived their lives according to all omens, visible and invisible. One of them was the daughter of a merchant, the other the daughter of the chaplain. The one sent a message to the other saying, Let us go out of the city today. Let us go to the king's pleasant gardens and let us enjoy ourselves. The other replied, Why not? And they prepared food, both hard and soft, and drink and coins to give away, as was the custom, as they left the city. But the first one, the merchant's daughter, riding in her chariot, Towards the northern gate, she saw a crowd of people there, gathered about, and looking to see what they were watching, she saw a fine young man walking on a tightrope, strung between two trees. Wasn't he elegant, strong, and able? And then he leapt from the tightrope and did a series of backflips and then front flips and then walked on his hands as the crowd went wild. She turned to her driver. She said, Who is that? Oh, that is Chitta from the village of Chandala. Chandala? Chandala? She turned her eyes away. She called for scented water to wash those eyes that had laid sight on an outcast. She gave orders to return to the city. And the people seeing her go understood why she went and they turned on Chitta. They said, Are, Dutta, Chandala, dirty, wretched outcast, because of you, we have received no gifts today, because of you, no food, no drink, no coins, because of you, Are, Dutta, Chandala. They beat him, they struck him, they left him there. Well, at the eastern gate, Sambuta, fared in the same manner. The chaplain's daughter, approaching in her chariot, again, she saw the crowd, she saw this fine young man. Why, he was turning a cartwheel on the tightrope. Who is that? That is a chandala. A chandala? And like her friend, she turned away. She washed her eyes with scented water. She returned into the city. Are, Dutta, Chandala, because of you we have received no gifts. They beat him, they struck him, they left him there. Well, the two cousins, the two friends, had agreed to meet in a city square by a fountain, and when they recovered their senses, they hobbled and limped and made their way. 
and then they recounted their woes and lamented. It is because of our birth, said Chitta. It is because of our birth, agreed Sambhuta. And as they sat there, a pair of Brahmin youth appeared and walked by. Why, one of them was reciting verses from the epic. They were walking very stiff, very proud, somewhat arrogant in their posture. Now, Sambhuta was skilled in the art of mimicry. Even though he was bruised and sore, he got up from his seat, he fell into step behind the Brahmin youth, and he perfectly imitated the youth's upright, proud, and arrogant posture. Well, Chitta had to smile. The imitation was so perfect. And when Sambhuta came back and sat beside him, he said, My friend, you have given me an idea. We shall disguise ourselves. We shall go north to Takasila. We will find ourselves a world-famous teacher. We will disguise ourselves as Brahmin youth. This is what they did. They went north. They put on the robes of a Brahmin youth. They found a world-famous teacher. And the news or a rumor spread throughout India that somewhere in the land there were two outcasts who were studying all the knowledges that belonged to the Brahmins. Well, after some time with their teacher, Chitta had mastered all his studies, but Sambhuta not quite. And one day a villager sent a message inviting the world-famous teacher to come and give a teaching in the village and receive an offering, a fine meal. The teacher agreed. He summoned his students, and they planned to go together. But that night, the heavens opened and the rain poured down, and the road was nearly washed away. And the teacher, he said to Chitta, Go you, take the youth with you, go and receive what is offered, give a teaching, and bring back some, whatever is offered, bring back some to me. Well, in the morning, Chitta set off with the Brahmin youth and Sambhuta, and they came on the dusty, dirty road, and they made their way and were given water to wash their feet while the villagers prepared the meal of rice porridge. And then the villagers set the bowls down before each of the youth, and they said, Nibatu, let it cool. Sambhuta, he was a little confused by all this activity and this unfamiliar setting, and he helped himself to a ball of rice porridge before it had cooled. He set it in his mouth, and it burned his mouth. He called out in the language of the Chandala, Kalu, and looked over at Chitta, who also, he lost his mindfulness. He forgot himself, and he replied, Nicola, Nicola, swallow it, swallow it. But the other youth heard this language. Kalu, Nicola, Nicola, what is this? And were suspicious. Chitta gave the thanks offering, they received the meal, and they returned to the home of their teacher. But the Brahmin, the youths, sat around in clusters, repeating those words and wondering, Kalu, Nicola, Nicola, what was that? Where do they come from, those two? And one of them said, Ha, ha, Ujjaini, I know it. They are from the village of Chandala, outside Ujjaini. Chandala, Chandala? Well, they cursed them. Are, Dutta, Chandula, you have deceived us. You have disguised yourselves. You, worthy, you are not. They would have struck them, they would have beat them, but a man going by stopped them, and he spoke to Chitta and Sambhuta. He heard their story. He said, It is because of your birth. It is because of your birth. You must go now. Live the life of renunciance. And so that is what they did. They made their way to a village, not far from Takasila, and from the village 
they found a forest, established themselves as hermits there, and went on alms round to receive offerings in the village, and they lived out their days there in the forest, and then they died, and they passed from one state of existence to another. They passed from one state of existence to another and were reborn in the womb of a deer, both of them. And from the time they emerged from their mother's womb, they were inseparable. They went everywhere together, browsing under the trees, nibbling on the green shoots, sipping from the water, the banks of the Naranjara. And one day a hunter, coming into the forest, saw them side by side, flank by flank, nuzzle by nuzzle, and with one throw of his knife, he killed them both. And they fell from one state of existence to another. And they were reborn as osprey. And from the time they hatched from those osprey eggs, they were inseparable. They went everywhere together, soaring great heights above the river, diving down to fish and hunt, and resting at night, sheltering wing to wing, neck to neck. And one day, a bird hunter, coming into that part of the forest, he saw them there on the banks of the river, and with one throw of his rope, he lassoed them, he caught them, and he killed them both. And they fell from one state of existence to another. And a fourth time they were born, this time in the human realm. Chitta was born as the son of the treasurer in Kozambi. Sambuta was born as the son of the king in Uttara Panchala. Now, when they were still quite young, both of them remembered their past lives. Chitta remembered his lives in succession as an osprey, as a deer, as an acrobat and outcast. He remembered his friendship, his closeness with his cousin. Sambuta only remembered his existence as an outcast acrobat, and he remembered well his cousin Chitta. Well, they both grew up, living separate lives, wondering what had become of the other. 
When Shitta turned 16, he decided to renounce the worldly life. He set forth for the Himalayas. He found a hermitage and began to practice there. Sambhuta, well, he became king. He became the king of the kingdom in Uttara Panchala. Now, Chitta, after some time, practicing austerities, entering into deep states of concentration, he asked himself, what of my cousin? What of Sambhuta? Is it possible that there may be some way I could see what had happened to him? And casting his gaze throughout the realm of India, he perceived that indeed Sambhuta had become king of the kingdom. The royal sunshade had been raised above him and he was in the midst of performing his royal duties. Chitta said to himself, I could go now. I could go and find Sambhuta. I could invite him to join me here. But now is not the time. He still has much good to do in the world. I will go later when he has reigned long and well. Well, the decades went by. One decade, another, until 50 years had passed. And at that time, people were still singing in the kingdom of Uttara Panchala, the song that the king had composed on the day that the royal sunshade was raised above him. It was a simple song. But the people loved it. It went a bit like this. Sa a pung, na ra nung, sapalung, suchi nung, na kamana kinchana mukangati. For everyone, deeds well performed yield fruit. There is no action which is empty of result. I see the king. Great and generous is he, by his own deeds does he come to majesty. And then the first two lines repeated. sa bang na ra nung But the second verse was a little bit different. It finished with the line, What of Chitta, my good friend? Will his kind heart reward him in the end? For 50 years, the people had been singing the king's song. Well, Chitta resolved that now is the time he would come. Now is the time that he would approach. He would find a way to speak to the king and invite him to join him for his remaining years and live out his life practicing in the mountains. So by his power, Chitta arose in the air, traveled over the forests and fields, and alighted in the king's park, in the king's park, not far from the king's palace. Now there had been a windstorm, and a young man was in the park picking up sticks, making little bundles here and there, and the young man was singing as he worked. What was he singing? Why, the king's song, of course. sa a pang na ra nang sa pa lang su chi nang Well, the bodhisattva, the wise chitta, he sat and listened for some time, and then he approached the young man. He said, Young man, I have been watching you now for a good hour or more. Do you not know any other songs than this one? Well, I do, wise man, but it is my favorite. It is the king's song. And could you sing a third verse if I were to teach it to you? I think so. And so Chitta taught him a third verse and instructed him to go before the king, to ask the king to sing his song, and then to sing the third verse in reply. Well, the young fellow had never made any attempt to meet the king, but this was the day, surely. He went home, he told his mother all, and she 
helped him prepare and put on his best clothes, and he went, he asked for an audience with the king. He went before the king, he bowed, and he said, if your majesty would please sing your song, I would like also to sing for you. The king was a little puzzled, but he was happy to sing his song. Sa bung na ra nung. He sang it in the way that he liked to. And when he had sung both verses, the young man sang the third verse. Sa bung na ra nung. For everyone, deeds well performed yield fruit. There is no action which is empty of result. Recognize your old friend Chitta waiting near, for his kind heart has brought him happy here. What? said the king. What? What are you saying? What do you mean? And the young man explained that this radiant being had appeared in the king's park while he was picking up sticks, and this person, this radiant figure, had taught him the verse. And so the king mounted his chariot. He went out of the palace grounds and made his way to the king's park. He came forward and there indeed was Chitta. He bowed deeply to him. The two embraced. They told stories of their lives. And then Chitta, he said, you have clearly reigned well. I can see by your demeanor that you have no regrets. Is it time now for you to join me in the mountains so that we may live out our lives together in quiet and solitude? The king reflected. He thought of all the pleasures that he enjoyed, the music, the dancing, the food, the comfort, he thought of the austerities that would surely await him living in a remote hermitage in the mountains. He said, Chitta, wise Chitta, why do you not renounce your hermitage and join me here? We will rule together. Think of all the good and all the generosity that we will perform together. Your counsel will guide me. But Chitta said, You have no need of my counsel. You are wise indeed. You have already performed great generosity and great goodness. And then, by his power, he alighted in the air. He bade farewell to his cousin, and he departed for his northern hermitage. Well, Sambuta, seeing him go, he felt a pang of regret, of longing. And he mounted his chariot, returned to the palace grounds. He alighted, and just as the sun was going down, he entered the palace, and he saw a tiny ant making its way across the step, carrying an even tinier morsel of food. And he thought to himself, all beings, all sentient beings seek happiness, but only human beings know the difference between a happiness that lasts for a short time and a happiness that endures. He entered, he enjoyed a vast array of pleasant foods. He enjoyed the dancing and the music as he had on so many other occasions. And then he climbed the steps to his bedchamber. He lay down in comfort. And as he set his head upon the pillow, he said to himself, how many sense pleasures indeed have I enjoyed in this single lifetime? and in countless lifetimes. Surely, I am ready to let go. And in the morning when he awoke, 
He felt firm in his resolve. He summoned his sons and daughters. He gave them instructions to practice generosity, to hear and listen to the needs of their people. And then, in the company of his army, he set forth, and over many weeks they made their way to the northern kingdom, to the northern hermitage, where Chitta was in residence. And then, dismissing his army, Sambuta the king entered, and bowed before his wise cousin. He said, teach me how to sit like you. Teach me how to be in stillness. Teach me how to tame my mind. Chitta welcomed him. He taught him, and they sat together and entered into deep states of concentration. They welcomed visitors and students, and they dedicated the merit of their practice to all beings, past, present, and future, saying, may all beings be at ease, may all beings be happy, may all beings realize their true potential in goodness and in wisdom. Sambhuta Chattaka.